Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. The people might be aware that we've started our next book about unintended consequences. An unintended consequence arises when the government takes away people's abilities to make decisions for themselves, and they react in ways that the lawmakers didn't intend, and weird things start to happen. One of the mistakes that people make when they think about unintended consequences is they think that this is the result of poorly written legislation, which, granted, it could be, but that's not the driving factor. The driving factor is that the government has taken away people's abilities to make decisions for themselves. Even if the legislation is perfectly written, you're still going to have unintended consequences because you're coercing people. No matter what you try to accomplish, the minute you say, and it will be so, there are unintended consequences. Right. Unintended consequences are a problem with human behavior. Some of the unintended consequences that we're going to talk about are counterintuitive, they're surprising, and it's, I think, a never-ending reminder not to try to accomplish too much before you get some input on how things are going. Let's start with a simple one that's sitting out in my garage. Do you have a minivan? Not anymore. I've had a sequence of them. I think I'm on my fourth or fifth one now. If you recall, when we were kids, nobody had minivans. We had station wagons. Station wagons. Yeah, exactly. With the big area in the back where you could roll around while your parents are driving. And they were fantastic, right? Because they had this plastic wood grain sticker that went on the side. (laughs) Right. And it it made them look as if they were made out of wood. Why would that somehow be a good thing? (laughs) I was never able to figure that out. Station wagons were remarkably dangerous things. They had those bench seats. Remember those? I mean, nowadays you have bucket seats. The driver has a seat. The passenger has a seat. These were bench seats. It just goes all the way along. You could stuff, you know, four or five people if they're small in there. Seat belts never really came up. If you really wanted one, it was there, but it only attached across your lap. Later on, we had the requirement that seatbelts be installed in the cars, but there was no law (laughs) that you had to wear them. And so, you know, if you're getting together with a bunch of your friends, your mother's going to drive you all to the pool or Cub Scouts or whatever it is. You've got five guys in the back of the station wagon. I don't mean the back seat. I mean, like the cargo area rolling around back there. That's just what people did. And I can't impress upon people how ridiculous our behaviors were. I remember... We had to go out with a friend's father, and our two fathers were inside the front of a pickup truck. And my friend and I were in the back, in the open air, Mm -hmm. kind of hanging out there. And we decided that it would be a particularly good idea to lay on the cabin with our hands stretched out before us. A Superman. So we could feel like Superman. (laughs) That's exactly right. (laughs) And, And here we were. Two morons laid across a truck cabin. There was no way for us to come through this unscathed. Right. And what happened? The guy who was driving slammed on the brakes, and we ran the risk of tumbling right over the front of the truck into its path. And nobody thought that this was particularly weird. That was just life back then. But interestingly, while we no longer have station wagons with us, it's not because of any of the reasons we were just talking about, the safety issue. It's an unintended consequence of cafe standards, that is, the regulations the government put in place that says that cars have to have a certain mileage to be sold in the United States. What's interesting about this is the cafe standards, the mileage standards, don't apply to individual vehicles. They apply to the fleet. So if I'm Ford and I'm producing a whole bunch of cars, as long as the average of these things is above whatever the standard is, certain miles per gallon, I'm good. Well, here's the problem. Station wagons got horrible mileage. We had one that got, I'm not kidding you, James, nine miles to the gallon. <laughs> I was going to predict eight. <laughs> yeah, that just right. seems right. Yeah. And so and so all of a sudden, American car manufacturers are faced with this problem of one of their major lines, the station wagons, get such horrible gas mileage, it's pulling down the average of their fleet. They're not going to be in compliance with the CAFE standards. And so what happens? This is the unintended consequence. American car manufacturers stop producing station wagons. Now, of course, there are people who want station wagons. You've got a big family or kids or whatever. They start producing minivans instead. Why the change? Because under the law, minivans weren't cars. They were trucks. (laughs) (laughs) And so different standards applied to them. And so all of a sudden, the average mileage of your fleet of cars goes up because you're no longer selling this low mileage car. You're selling a low mileage truck instead. The day child number three showed up on my doorstep, 
we were out buying a minivan. Oh, yeah. Because you couldn't fit three child seats across the back in a normal sedan. So any family bigger than four, minivan was probably the only answer left. So here we have an unintended consequence. The law did not set out to destroy station wagons or replace them with minivans, but it was an unintended consequence of manufacturers and consumers reacting to the fact that the government has now told them they can only drive vehicles and achieve a certain mileage. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. James Stacy Taylor joins us this week. James is Associate Professor of Philosophy, Religion, and Classical Studies at the College of New Jersey. He has written numerous research articles for, among others, the Journal of Medical Ethics, the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, the Journal of Philosophical Research, and Social Philosophy and Policy. He's the editor of Personal Autonomy, published by Cambridge University Press, The Metaphysics and Ethics of Death, published by Oxford University Press, and has authored Stakes in Kidneys, Why Markets in Human Body Parts are Morally Imperative, Practical Autonomy and Bioethics, Death, Posthumous Harm, and Bioethics, and most recently, Markets with Limits, The Merits of Market Critical Arguments, which you can find on Amazon. There's a link in the show notes. James joins us for a two-part episode in which we discuss the fact that people have intense emotional reactions to buying and selling certain things. Among them, for example, sex, body parts, and votes. James joins us to ask the question, is it possible that markets shouldn't or can't handle these things? James, welcome to Words and Numbers. The astute listeners will remember you as a previous Words and Numbers guest. You came on to discuss repugnant markets. Why don't you give us the two-minute version of the half-hour thing that we did last time? What are repugnant markets and why do I have to care? Repugnant markets are markets for things like kidneys, sex, blood, votes, markets that a lot of people think are problematic in some way, either because they think that they'll lead to exploitation or they're worried that people will be buying who are wealthy and people will be selling who are poor, or they're worried that it's just not the sort of thing that people should be actually giving away or selling. So somebody might say, for example, Elizabeth Anderson, but we shouldn't have markets in surrogacy arrangements because a woman renting her womb to somebody else is immoral. Anderson claims we shouldn't have markets because we shouldn't have surrogacy at all. And you came in and you defended, if I'm remembering correctly, every single one of these markets. Because I'm a wicked person. Well, <laughs> let's put that off to the side. That may actually be true. But you were very positive on all these sorts of markets. So imagine my surprise when I logged onto my computer one day and saw that you had written a book called Markets with Limits. How did we go from where you were to limits? And if your limits weren't in those earlier things, where are they? Well, I like to think of myself as being on a progress towards enlightenment without the sandals, the saffron robe, or the mountaintop. But, James, I'm willing to take you as my guru, so clearly things are going to go badly wrong anyway. <laughs> but my thinking's evolved a little bit, so I'm still very much in favor of all of these markets. But I do think that there might be limits to market norms, by which I mean people pursuing things purely for their own self-interest, independent of anything else. The way in which I see markets as being legitimately limited would be with respect to, say, professional activities, like legal work or academic work, or even, say, sporting events, if you want to be a professional sportsman, as Anthony Davis clearly is. <laughs> and my idea here is that some types of professional activity, say the activity of being a lawyer, have standards of excellence built into the practice itself. So if you're going to be a really, really good lawyer, then you should work for the benefit of your client. But I don't think that you should do it purely for the money. So if you have Anthony Davis, who's murdered somebody, he comes to me as his attorney and said, Taylor, I've murdered somebody, but I'm super rich and I'll give you a huge bonus if you get me off. I think that as a lawyer, I should be in the practice of serving justice 
And so I might say, tell Anthony, it doesn't matter how much you're going to pay me. My duties as a lawyer prohibit me from making everything a pure market transaction. And similarly with academia, we would often look askance at somebody who came up and said, I've just got this huge contract from Big Tobacco to do studies showing that tobacco increases your life by 30 years. We might think that person's been corrupted. They might be doing studies for tobacco. They might even be funded by tobacco. But what should actually govern their interest is not the money they're being paid, but the search for the truth. And if it turns out that the study doesn't support the tobacco company's interests, then they should go right ahead and just say, this is how things are. So I think that markets should be limited in the sense that market norms should be limited. Certain professional practices should be governed by standards internal to those practices. We shouldn't just pursue money. Have we asked the right person on here? Are you the same James Stacey Taylor who was here before? I am. I'm the James Stacey Taylor. We should sell kidneys. We should sell votes. <laughs> we should sell all sorts of things. All of that is perfectly legitimate. But, Anthony, you'd like this. We shouldn't sell our souls. All right. I want to back up a minute because you passed over something that in your book I thought was fascinating. I just want to underline it to make sure the, the readers get it. You make a distinction, as have other philosophers, between the morality of buying and the morality of consuming. Right. That is, to take sex as an example, you can give it away. That's morally acceptable, but you shouldn't sell it. That's morally unacceptable or by certain views. The point being that whether you think it's acceptable or not acceptable, that's actually two separate questions. Right. Somebody like Elizabeth Anderson is going to say that how we buy and sell sex is actually going to matter quite a bit. Elizabeth Anderson would say, James Harrigan becomes a professional sex therapist. And Harrigan doesn't just say, you can do whatever you want with me for money. He says, look, I'm a professional. And what we're going to do is going to be bound by what I, James Harrigan, want to do and think is appropriate. So James Harrigan might have certain views concerning patriarchal norms of sexuality. And as a sex therapist, he tries to undermine these. So Harrigan sells sex, but he sells sex in a certain way. By contrast, Anthony Davis is a happy hooker. <laughs> Anthony Davis just says, for 50 bucks, you can do whatever you like. And somebody says, well, I know you don't like this particular act, Anthony. And he says, doesn't matter. 50 bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> now, somebody like Elizabeth Anderson would say, James Harrigan retains his autonomy, his authenticity, and so on. He's a professional sex therapist. He's somebody like an idealized attorney, because lawyers and sex workers are pretty much the same in many respects. By contrast, Anthony Davis, he's the bad type of sex worker for Elizabeth Anderson. He's somebody who's a lawyer who will just be a hired gun, doesn't care about justice. He's just interested in making a buck. So some philosophers might say there's a distinction to be drawn here. How sex is sold matters. Okay, so we've got three things going on now. The question of the morality of the object itself, the question of the morality of selling the object, which is a separate issue, and the morality of how the object is sold, which is now a third issue. Yeah. And the first one, which is, are there some things which you cannot buy and sell? My suspicion is almost nobody takes the position there are some things that cannot be bought and sold. Instead, a lot of the action focuses on how things are bought and sold and in what situations things are bought and sold. Let me back you up a minute because I'm as staunch free market as they come. And I would say that there are things that should not be bought and sold. And I'll give persons as an example. So think about slavery. And this is an interesting conversation, but I haven't heard yet a foundational principle. In that case, I would fall back on the foundational principle that one's autonomy is inalienable, meaning I cannot separate it from myself, therefore I cannot sell myself. Yeah, I would agree that other persons are the sort of thing that you cannot buy and sell, but you also can't give them away. So James Harrigan decides to be an altruistic slave trader. Now, what James Harrigan does is he goes off, captures people, and then gives them away as slaves. That would be clearly impermissible. So what we're focusing on is an objection not to the selling of slaves, but to the practice of slavery. It doesn't matter if James Harrigan gives them away or sells them. It's wrong to enslave people. 
and yet I can give away people under certain circumstances. Almost every jurisdiction in the United States will allow you to drop a baby off at a firehouse. Right. That's functionally giving away a human being. It would be giving away a human being if you had property rights over them. In most jurisdictions, which I think have a sensible approach, you're not really giving away a human being, you're giving away your parental rights. I want to go back to the slavery question. You identified the wrongness as enslaving someone else, which is sidestepping my foundational principle argument. My foundational principle argument is that the right to oneself is inalienable. In other words, because of that, it would be wrong for me to sell myself into slavery. And it would also be wrong if we accept that foundational principle for you to give yourself away as a slave. Yes. So it's not the buying and selling where the wrongness lies. It's you believe that persons are a type of thing that ought not to be either given away or sold. Okay. So we're not finding the wrong in the market. We're finding the wrong in the type of thing. So there, what we've done, in one can argue whether the foundational principle is correct, but let's take it as a given that the foundational premise is correct, then these other things follow. What then is the foundational principle, for example, that makes it okay for the lawyer to sell his services under certain conditions, but not under others? That's a good question. It might be that there's no particular foundational principle at work. It might be we have a social convention, but lawyers will behave in this particular way. And what we want our lawyers to do is to pursue justice, to pursue truth, and not to be perverted by money. Maybe academics might be a better example here, because we can imagine a lawyer who says, I'm a really good lawyer, I take any case to my clients, no matter how bad their arguments or case is, I win, I'm an awesome lawyer. But it would be weird if you had somebody who says, I'm a fantastic academic, I look at the evidence, and whoever pays me the most, then I write a book saying their view is right, and I'm willing to pervert the evidence, I ignore it, I hide some, I twist it we would probably say something's gone badly wrong in that case. You're not really a good academic because a good academic should be pursuing the truth. Earlier, you used the word mores quite a bit. It seems to be that that's what you're appealing to. Now, mores seem to be an emergent phenomenon. You can't just make up mores. They occur somewhat naturally over time, given human interactions. So what you're saying is, we need to have mores, for lack of a better term, running this show, and yet mores are an emergent phenomenon that you can't just make up and say, here, follow this. I think that's right. Here's maybe another way of looking at things. Let's imagine that we reward excellence in academic work. If we're going to reward excellence in academic work, we have to ask ourselves, what's going to count as excellent academic work? If the answer is, what counts as excellent academic work is you're able to secure a lot of money for your academic work. In other words, you're able to get a lot of reward for your academic work. That seems a rather circular argument, because then the claim is, I'm doing excellent academic work, so I should be rewarded. How do we know you're doing excellent academic work? Because I'm getting rewarded. We need some sort of independent criteria for working out what excellent academic work is. And I think you're right, James, this might vary from society to society. I can see medieval European society saying excellent academic work is that which furthers the glory of God. So if you're a philosopher in medieval Europe and you give a fantastic argument for the existence of God, nobody can undermine it, then we'll say that's excellent academic work because it furthers the purpose. But I'm still wondering who gets to decide now. Are we going to throw this open to a bunch of sociologists? Will we just take whatever they say as correct? Or do we have to go somewhere else? What will determine what's acceptable and not? I'm not seeing the line that I think I need to see. So I take it your case is, why should we accept one particular view of excellent academic work rather than another? Yeah, I think the question of who gets to decide is a very meaningful question. Right. Presumably, we can eliminate some possibilities. It would be weird to say excellent academic work is that which misrepresents others' work as much as possible and gets away with it. That would be weird. If, however, we say excellent academic work is that which furthers understanding of our subject matter, that seems at least to be a contender. 
Now, I agree with you, James, that doesn't show that that is going to be the definitive account of excellent academic work. But it seems that it's a better contender than that which perverts others' work. And if you're looking in the world of better and worse, things are actually pretty simple. But if you're looking at better, worse than what we need to do, now it's very complicated. Right. And I agree, because now we could have a real problematic discussion as to why should we say somebody who works on the novels of Charlotte Bronte, that's excellent academic work. Somebody might ask quite reasonably, why do we care about Charlotte Bronte? Shouldn't we devote resources to, say, study in cancer treatments instead? So I think those sort of questions as to where we devote resources, those are real questions. And if you're a Bronte person, it's going to be pretty hard to defend studying Charlotte Bronte and taking resources away from cancer. By that standard, it's very difficult to defend anything. Yeah. Now, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying I've got this big picture sussed out, but maybe some of the very minute details here, there's no way of knowing. I think that's fair. At the end of the book, I note that pretty much explicitly. I say that this book is in the middle of a research project, where should the moral limits of markets lie? And at the start of another research project, how do we ascertain what is really good academic work? How do we determine whether market norms or whether market incentives should apply to certain types of academic work, but not to others? It's fascinating because this is a question at its heart that's literally a question asked by Plato couple thousand years ago. Who gets to decide is something that comes up in his laws. And there's no right answer. There's just a lot of discussion. And it seems that as is usually the case, the best of us are right back to that same notion that we're going to have to deal with maybe an amorphous sort of knowledge. You squeeze it one way and it pokes out another. There may be ways we can determine how to arrange academic work even if we're not sure what its real purpose is, or even indeed if it has a real ultimate purpose. Imagine that you provide everybody with a $20,000 bonus if they produce a book. There's no limit to how many $20,000 bonuses you get. Are you going to check your references and write carefully and thoughtfully, or are you going to pump out those puppies as much as possible? Very short books. Yeah, very Very short short books. books. That's right. So they'll sound like this. (laughs) I'll just be popping out. (laughs) That is correct. So one of the concerns that I had is maybe we should look at how we incentivize academic work. If we have short-term horizons, Britain did this with its research assessment exercise. You had to submit your CV every year, and you've got a certain number of points for however many publications you have. If you have short-term horizons, you might incentivize people to write quickly and more carelessly. So it might be better to have medium-term horizons or longer-term horizons. Or maybe we just say, just put up your two best publications and we're going to check them for accuracy. This is exactly the problem I think that the Academy has, because we end up hiring very young people, actually, for these jobs. And in order to keep those jobs, they have to publish a lot, but they're not old enough, not experienced enough to publish anything worth reading. I want to hear from 50-year-olds, not 30-year-olds. We've turned that on its head. I'm not sure there's a better way. I just know that this way is lousy. I agree. My suggestion is runs into the problem of what do we do about the sort of arms race for young academics? Because there's few academic jobs, even somewhere like the College of New Jersey, which is mainly a teaching school, we're going to look at your publications first. So everybody knows to get an academic job, you've got to publish a lot and in really good journals. But that's give people an incentive to cut corners, not to check references, not to do their homework properly, to have spectacular novel theses rather than mundane, boring theses, which aren't going to get published as much. I think we're missing an important component here in the incentives, and that is that the university's accreditation is a function of the number of publications its faculty has. And in turn, the university's ability to attract students is a function of its accreditation. And the accrediting bodies are basically a government protected guild. Is it the case simply here that this is not an instance in which markets can't work, but one in which markets are being prevented from working? I'm always willing to lay the blame at the feet of government, so (laughs) I have some sympathy for that. Maybe we should just have private accreditation bodies, or even no accreditation at all. 
for listeners who are up on this, the accreditation bodies in higher education are private. However, they are protected by the government. It's very difficult to come up with a competing accreditation body. I want to shift the gears for a minute, yet stay on the same topic. You've been talking about how to evaluate excellence in academic publications. I want to look at other markets that might exhibit the same phenomena. For example, art. Do we not have the same problem in art? I think we do. And yet we leave it to the market. Do we leave it to the market? I'm not sure. That's a genuine question. It's not a leading Mm. question. Oh, same here. This is beyond my expertise. I'm not familiar enough with the art market to really say anything. But my limited understanding is the art market functions not so much to identify excellence, but to identify things which could be held to be excellent. Right. Anticipating someone else's valuation of excellence. Yeah. Then that's interesting because that's the same phenomenon that goes on in the stock market. If I'm a short term investor, I don't care whether the stock is valuable. I care whether you think it's valuable so I could unload it on you tomorrow. But could there be a complication here in that art investors might look to art sellers to be told where to go? I suppose that happens in the stock market as well, though, with stock brokers. Sure. I'm kind of left wondering if it weren't for, for example, the accreditation machinery that's in place, if we wouldn't be having this discussion that academic publication would be market driven in the same way with the same warts and same beauty that art or stocks are driven. Possibly. And I even give an example of a book of how we can imagine an alternative America where market driven academics turn out to be much better than our current system of academics. Mm. So you have a consumer body who loves really high quality academic work. They're really concerned that it's accurate. They're concerned the references are excellent and they're willing to pay for it. Right. And if somebody turns out that they're producing sort of shoddy work, references are bad and so forth, then they lose market share really quickly. So there we could have a market orientated approach, which would have very careful, excellent academic work. And James, I think, is going to point out that I've used the term excellent academic work because I'm smuggling in my own particular conception of what that might look like. That seems right. Sort of really accurate and novel. (laughs) That seems exactly right. I'm not saying I wouldn't do the same thing. Right. Because we could have a market for academic work where not so good academic work rises to the fore. We've had that for decades. Go look again at the output of any sociology department. (laughs) If that doesn't cinch it for you, go look at the English department next. Look at some people who are popularizers of academic work, whether it be philosophy, English, or popularizers of safe physics. Often they're not well regarded by their peers, but they're very, very successful. We appear to have this emergent evaluation process in social media. In economics, someone will say something, and all of a sudden there's thousands of people who disagree with the person who are trying to fact check, and then coming to other economists like me saying, do you think this is right, and I have to go and figure it out. And I have an incentive, a market incentive, to do the research well, to say, yes, what he's saying is correct, or no, what he's saying is wrong, and here's the truth, because my reputation now is based on that. I'll get more hits and more likes and more follows if I'm right and fewer if I'm not. So, Anthony, would you say that we should judge how good an economist is by looking at their social media following? (laughs) Well, that's an interesting question. I would imagine that short term, you can't tell anything. Long term, I would imagine that there is a correlation. Would you say the same for other disciplines? Imagine that you have, or you don't need to imagine, but say, we look at who's a really good philosopher by how their social media presence is. Because I take it with economics being more math-based. You could tell people, no, this is wrong. But philosophy is not so clear we could do that. Right. And I think I'm going to have to fall back on Harrigan's criticism of how do you define what's great. In fact, I'm going to have to back off of what I said earlier. I think that the social media hits, if you want to think of it that way, are correlating maybe not with the quality of the economic work itself, but with the quality of the combination of the economic work and the ability to communicate it well. That seems right. Could you have somebody who's a very good economic communicator where the quality of the work is rather bad? Yes. I have examples on the top of my head, right? We have those. And what happens is they do have a following, but every time they put something out there, there's solid criticism coming back. And by solid, I mean something substantially above, well, you're an idiot. (laughs) And I've got two people in mind for exactly this. 
on the one hand, I think James has described Anthony Fauci, who seems to do a brilliant job of messaging, but I think he's for sale in a lot of ways. And then I think Neil deGrasse Tyson fits that same basic model. I was thinking of Robert Reich. Well, yeah, him too. An excellent communicator. But there's this other guy who had a TV show, Mr. Science kind of TV show, and his name escapes me at this point. The guy point, with the bow tie? Yeah, exactly so. He's got a bachelor's degree in something. He's not a legitimate scientist. He's a popularizer of the ideas and not even good enough that I remember his name all the time. Bill Nye. Bill Nye. That's science the guy. one. Thank Bill you. Nye Bill the Nye, science the science guy. guy. Yeah. So we've got a small handful here right off the tops of our heads of people who seem to make a very comfortable living talking about something that a lot of other people know a lot more about. You get strange examples like Paul Krugman, who is a superb economist within a certain field of economics. He's a superb communicator in a field of economics in which he actually is not a good economist. <laughs> <laughs> and he seems to be for sale. Mm. I'm starting to make your case. <laughs> I am. Because we all know people who are available to the highest bidder and who are happy enough to bend their findings to meet what people want. Yeah, I think on this point, I'm very clearly making your case all of a sudden. James, you might be in agreement with me, but it's going to be pretty hard to actually nail down and give necessary and sufficient conditions what counts as a really good philosopher or a really good economist. But we could say that there might be perverse incentives at play in academia and every other field, but we should be wary of. And I think that runs counter to my original thought, which was, okay, we've got to have these high-minded standards and people have to buy into them just as a foundational issue. That sounds good when you started talking about lawyers and professors, but I go down that chain until I get to Taco Bell employees. And I'm not sure that the same thing works. It might not be universalizable at all. Let's just say I have unformed opinions by the time we get to that point. Right. So it might be that in certain fields, we would want people to produce results but aren't simply driven by who will pay me for this particular result. But in other fields, say the person who works at Taco Bell, we're perfectly happy for somebody to put together a taco however somebody likes it, because we think yeah, excellence in taco making really is satisfying customer preference. And what's the difference anyway? With the Taco Bell, you're in a position where each individual consumer is capable of judging well the quality of this thing. And we may disagree. You may like the taco, I may not, and that's fine. This is not that I'm wrong and you're right. We actually have two different tastes here. But when it comes to something like academic research, or even art for that matter, it's not entirely clear to each and every person that this is high quality or not. They've got to take an expert's opinion on this. And even the expert opinion. Right. Which one are you going to take? Because the experts disagree significantly, and a lay person isn't going to know which of the many experts to turn to. Is it then a preponderance of the individuals? Is it a relative thing? Well, this guy has this many and this guy has this many, so let's go with the guy who has more. But notice where we are. We're now talking about a product for which the general consumer cannot come up with some valuation. Right. Now, there are other products like that that exist in market environments. For example, somebody sells me a toaster and says this is a safe toaster. It's not going to kill you. I'm not an electrician. I'm not an engineer. I don't know. But there's a market opportunity for Underwriters Laboratory to come along as a profit-earning entity and to evaluate that toaster and say, yes, indeed, it's safe or no, it's not. And if it is safe, we'll put our stamp on it. And Underwriters Laboratory has a profit incentive to do that evaluation well because the toaster company won't pay for the underwriter's stamp of approval if the toaster company thinks that I, the consumer, don't trust Underwriters Laboratory. So is it possible that if you left the academic market, left the art market, left the lawyer market alone, that something like that would emerge, a market solution to your problem? Possibly. But what I'm hearing you say, Anthony, is what we really need is an underwriter's laboratory for academic work. Yes. And presumably it's got to be one which is driven by the profit motive, where the profit motive is linked to its doing its job well. Yes. Because one of the worries that I have with contemporary academia is we have a system of peer review, but referees have no incentive for doing a good job whatsoever. In fact, you've got a disincentive to do a good job. You submit a paper to the Journal of Higher Economics, which I've just made up, and James Harrigan's going to referee it. Now, James Harrigan doesn't get paid for refereeing. 
he doesn't get any real advantage for doing a good job or a bad job. So James is probably going to do a pretty crappy job. He'll read through your paper. If he doesn't agree with it, he might find reasons to reject it. He's not going to check your references or check your sources, because that's really time consuming. So peer review, as it's practiced, really doesn't have any proper incentive for referees to do a good job. We might be better off with a sort of underwriter's laboratory where you have a company where journals send papers to the company and the company hires people to actually check them and do a good job. And then the journal can say, look, all of our papers have been fact-checked by the Harrigan Davis Laboratory of Fact-Checking. And so we're back to this government intervention problem. We don't have for-profit peer review process because there's no financial incentive. Right. And there's no financial incentive because it's the accrediting bodies who decide that journal publications are good and these particular journals are good and these ones aren't. And they aren't subject to market forces because they're protected by the government. Yeah. Yeah, I'm much more comfortable in my original position, which is that this is not a market failure problem. This is a government failure problem. I'm not opposed to that conclusion. <laughs> I think the three of us are in heated agreement over this. <laughs> And what I actually suggest is maybe what we should do is pay referees. We have a bounty system for referees. In order to get referees like James Harrigan, James isn't lazy. He's just rational and self-interested. Doing a good job refereeing, no value to him. But if we maybe pay him for every error that he detects, then James is actually going to start checking manuscripts much more carefully. Now, in response, Anthony, you're going to do a better job of making sure your references and your claims are actually accurate especially if we require you to pay James for every error that he detects. Well, that'd be great. It would. God, I'd be rich. If Anthony paid me for every <laughs> one of his mistakes, I have found we'd be rich right here. But notice something interesting here. If indeed there were a way that we could turn all of this over to the market, I think we would end up in a situation that colleges and universities don't want to be in. And that is to discover that research doesn't matter at all. That is, their ultimate consumer, the students, have no interest in this. That might well be the case. I have one thing left to say about refereeing, I guess. But to me, it would be fascinating if that were no longer anonymous. I think everybody should know what everybody thinks. People would behave better on the refereeing side if they knew that this wasn't going to go to their buddy at the journal who sent it to them and he'll just put it in a file and nobody will ever know. I think if you had to send the referee reports to the author along with name, everybody's behavior would get a lot better. And conversely, what we could have is a system of publication which is anonymous. We divorce merit base, promotion, and so forth from publication, put it on to maybe excellence in teaching. Allow publication, but have publication be anonymous. Doesn't that remove almost all the incentive to publish? Yeah, it does. Except for people who are really interested in the subject matter. Sure. And want to have a good reputation. You'll have a lot less effort spent on research, which is just purely to get promotion, to get tenure, and so on. Wasn't this the practice back in the Middle Ages? You would have monks who would anonymously write tomes on the Gospels or whatever it is? That strikes a bell, but I'm not sure if that's actually the case. But imagine people on the internet post stuff anonymously all the time. They have heated discussions. I mean, who knows who Sheep Lover 107 is? <laughs> Could be anyone. But uh, heated except discussions. for the number 107, <laughs> I already do know who that is. But... If you look back at the American founding, a period of American history in which I'm very conversant, there were any number of high-profile, anonymously written broadsides and pamphlets, and they served a real purpose. You might be right here. I don't know that I agree with you yet. The more I understand, the more less reasonable I think you are. I think you're actually quite reasonable here. <laughs> yeah, that's something in itself. <laughs> well, I just don't know how far down the road I'm going to go with you. I know I'm going to be with you for at least part of the way. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, be sure to follow us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. Join Words and Numbers Backstage, the Facebook group where the conversation continues, and send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Until next week, try to be nice to one person. One person who doesn't deserve it. Just one. And who knows? It may turn into a trend. Give it a shot. You might feel good about yourself. You could say you tried. You tried. That's right. Till next week. Can't take it easy. See you next week, James. James.